Hello, happy Monday. Welcome to PCAP's Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. This week, PCAP is hosting a series of webinars all about the ecological goods and services provided by the Native Prairie Ecosystem. Tomorrow, Dr. Finlay with the University of Regina will be talking about the role of prairie wetlands or prairie lakes, wetlands, and dugouts as carbon sources or sinks. And on Wednesday, Graham Parsons with Saskatchewan Agriculture will be speaking about pollinators in his presentation called Beyond the Bee's Tongue. And check out the PCAP website for information or to register for these upcoming webinars. This is the fourth time that we are doing Prairie's Got the Goods Week and past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. Today, Dr. Mark Boyce, Professor of Ecology and Alberta Conservation Association Chair in Fisheries, Wildlife and Department of Biological Science, University of Alberta, will be speaking about adapting grassland grazing to boost carbon sequestration. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Eco-Friendly Sask, Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support has been provided by the University of Alberta. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions about the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard anytime during the presentation and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now a bit about today's presenter, Dr. Mark Boyce was recruited to the University of Alberta in 1999 to become the first Alberta Conservation Association Chair in Fisheries and Wildlife and Professor of Ecology in the Department of Biological Sciences. He has been teaching and conducting research since 1976 on a wide variety of basic and applied topics related to wildlife management and conservation biology, and more recently on the importance of grasslands in providing environmental goods and services, such as carbon storage and the maintenance of biodiversity. Dr. Boyce is an elected fellow of the Wildlife Society and the Royal Society of Canada and has been awarded the Miroslaw Romanowski Award by the RSC for using science to solve environmental problems. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Boyce. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, I think we are ready. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. And uh, I will uh, go through a, a set of slides and then uh, happy to answer questions after that. I've listed my my postdoc Tim uh, Dobert here as well, and he's helped me quite a lot in synthesizing the data on our project and helping me put some of these these slides together. Now, for some reason, I'm not advancing. There we go. Okay. Okay. So here's the out outline for my presentation. I will first talk about the importance of, of uh, grassland soils and and grazing on and, and sort of in the big picture of things um and then we'll then we'll we'll talk specifically about adaptive multi-paddock grazing which is a major focus of our research uh, program evaluating adaptive multi-paddock grazing relative to other th other types of grazing uh systems that are used um, across the great plains of, of canada um, and then, and then I'll describe a um, a grant that we received from the Agricultural Greenhouse Gases Program, which is a program by Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada uh, to support research um, along the lines of uh, of what we'll be talking about today. I'll I'll describe the methods that we use, especially sampling methods and the types of data that we've collected, and some of the preliminary results. It's not it's not a polished, finished product yet. There are some pieces that are 
that are still being developed, but we have enough results to be able to tell you the, um, some of the uh, uh, really interesting highlights. And, and then I will um, conclude with a, uh, a, a description of carbon markets and protocols, which is an exciting area uh, whereby ranchers can um, get paid to um, maintain these beautiful grasslands that we have in, in Canada. So the Great Plains of um, North America um, developed in uh, conjunction with bison grazing. And, and so this bison grassland uh, system co-evolved um, you know, at least over the last 9,000 years after the glaciers um, receded, we had somewhere between 30 million and 100 million uh, bison uh, roaming across the, the Great Plains um, that has resulted in very rich fertile soils and uh, unique uh, biodiversity. Um, and much of that has been converted to agricultural use, um, if not livestock grazing, row crop agriculture, other types of of agricultural development, um, and uh, that those competing uses have been a, a, a very major um, very major shift in in how the, the the grasslands of North America are are uh, are being used and and the carbon that is is stored there. So, as you all understand, I'm sure um, plants um, absorb carbon dioxide from the air and use that in photosynthesis. Um, a substantial amount of, of carbon is then fixed into sugars and um, um, other organic compounds that go into the roots and into the soil. Um, and then there is plant respiration that occurs as well. Um, but the soil is a real sink for, for carbon, and especially grassland soils. Uh, most of the biomass um, in a grassland is underneath the surface of, of the ground, and uh, there are vast stores of carbon. So I own a farm and on my, in Iowa, and on my farm in Iowa, um, where, where I grew up, uh, there are places where the black soil profile is as deep as I am tall. Um, in in the uh, uh, Aspen Parkland region of Canada, where I am right now, the average black soil profile is is 0.9 meters deep, and so there are vast amounts of carbon in these soils, and um, uh, and they are a sink for for carbon extracting carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in the soil where it's very safe. We have trees in, in Alberta. We have lots of lodgepole pine in the, in, in the mountains. They burn every 80 to 150 years. And then all that, all that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. We have trees in the boreal forest and the boreal forest is notorious for it being a fire maintained ecosystem. Uh, but, but grasslands, most of the carbon gets sunk into the soil. And, and even if there is a fire, it's a, a very small fraction of, of the biomass that ever, ever burns. And it's a very secure, long-term, thousands of years sort of storage place uh, for carbon. Now this shows uh, the prairie ecoregion of Canada. Uh, the entire area used to be native grasslands, but um, only the, the dark shaded areas on this map um, are currently in um, uh, uh, <clears throat> grasslands that are, that are maintained mostly for cattle grazing. So the numbers are over on the right. The, the entire area is 61 million hectares um, uh, and 50 million hectares of that has been cultivated. So 81% of our, of our native grasslands have been, have been cultivated. 11.4 um, are 
natural grasslands. Um, most of that is grazed by cattle. Um, and we have of native grasslands only 12.9% only remaining, uh, 7.8 million hectares. Now, uh, grasslands are uh, uh, very valuable from a, the standpoint of ecosystem uh, services. There's biodiversity, of course. Uh, uh, ranch lands that are maintained for for, for livestock are uh, uh, extremely valuable for wildlife habitat, uh, pollination, uh, wetland uh, and and um, hydrology uh, maintenance, uh, the prevention of flooding. Um, they provide livelihood for more than a, a billion people worldwide. Um, that uh, depend on, on livestock. Um, and then there are other um, sort of cultural and tourism recreation uh, uh, benefits, hunting, for example. Um, and, but, but soil health and climate regulation are on that list as well. So, in, and in fact, I, I think that probably all the people listening to this webinar would agree that cattle ranching is, is is the best use of our western rangelands, um, but avoiding uh, grassland conversion is is really extremely important. Um, the the worst thing that can happen to a native grassland is to see it plowed, and uh, and I've spent many hours on a tractor plowing just like this guy's doing here, um, and I have terrible guilt about it. But what that does is is to turn the soil up and and um, accelerates the respiration by soil organisms of carbon um, into the atmosphere, as well as as erosion goes on. And it takes very few years before we lose 30 to 50 percent of the carbon in, our, in grassland soils um, through cultivation. Uh, but surprisingly, grasslands don't seem to be getting as much attention as they as they should do. And even this uh, 2015 Paris um, Agreement that everyone references in context of climate change um, calls for the removal of atmospheric greenhouse gases and an increase in soil carbon stocks. But it doesn't even mention um, the, um, the the grasslands and uh, uh, yet, um, even more importantly, how important um, grassland carbon sequestration and storage can be in the context of, of climate change and, and reducing our climate crisis. So AMP grazing, uh, some of you may have heard it called holistic management. Uh, if you're from the UK or Australia, you've probably heard it called mob grazing. It's all the same, the same idea. And, and uh, essentially it involves moving livestock around um, in, in uh, multiple paddocks uh, so that you have high concentrations of livestock, as in the picture here on the upper right, high concentrations of livestock for a short period of time uh, before they're moved on to the next paddock. Oftentimes, those paddocks are created using electric fencing. Some some places, some some ranchers have have put up uh, um, barbed wire uh, fence fencing for a more permanent structure. But um, the beauty of of electric fencing is that it can be be moved around, and, and you can move the cattle to wherever is appropriate given the con conditions of grass at a particular point in time. Um, but the animals are put in for a short period of time at high density, and essentially they they eat everything um, by by being concentrated like that. The average length of time that an AMP grazer um, throughout the Great Plains of Canada keeps the animals in um, a paddock is 2.8 days, meaning roughly three days uh, before they're moved on to the next to the next pasture. But there's been a huge amount of controversy. And in fact, I can remember 40 years ago, 
Savory coming to the University of Wyoming, where I had my first job, and um, giving a talk. And just you know, the the range scientists <laughs> at at that time were just you know up in arms about his crazy ideas about this AMP grazing, um, and and he has been continuously challenged about the science, and to the to the point that you know. A number of studies have failed to so show support for AMP grazing, and as a consequence, Alan Savory and Richard Teague have claimed that there's something wrong with the scientific method and that you have to have controls and all that sort of thing and the, with the AMP structure where you're moving the, cat, the, the livestock around for very, varying lengths of time and, and it's, it's very dynamic, um, that scientific methods fail. Well, I think that Savory and Teague just hadn't figured out an appropriate sampling design. And the problem with these, with this pushback that they've given to the scientific met, to, to, to the use of science in evaluating AMP grazing is that the, the sampling designs in their projects were just not well done. And, 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 and so we spent a lot of time in our research on the sampling scheme. And in fact, I hired Lyman McDonald, who is the founder of West Incorporated, which stands for Western Ecosystem Stat Statistics and Technology, um, to, to review our sampling scheme and to ensure that we had an unbiased, rigorous assessment of AMP grazing. And Lyman's, Lyman, in fact, had a look at some of the other studies that had been done, including some of Richard Teague's work, pointing out that you know that these were set up to kind of prove that AMP grazing works, and 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 I, you know, I I wasn't even convinced um, until more recently that that uh, AMP grazing um, was as effective as it, as it appears to be. A lot of ranchers that that would swear by it, but the science was flawed from the standpoint of the sampling design. And what we came up with is a paired design. We identified a number, we started with 130 ranches, but by with a process of rigorous evaluation of how AMP grazing was done on these ranches and with a random sampling protocol, we narrowed it down to 30 AMP ranches. And then uh, th that Richard Teague assisted us in selecting those AMP ranches so we don't have any quibble about who's doing AMP and who's not. And then we have 30 paired ranches. Well, it turns out that 70% of ranchers across the Great Plains of Canada have some form of rest rotation. Um, and, and so it's unusual, in fact, anymore to have, you know, continuous grazing throughout the year sort of thing, um, that there's almost always some kind of rest rotation system in place. But what we wanted to do was to compare AMP with whatever else is out there. And, and so we selected a, uh, ideally an adjacent ranch for the topography and soils and grasses, uh, grass um, uh, species and, and uh, composition were, were about the same. And, and so that we can compare um, the AMP ranch with a non-AMP ranch over the entire spectrum of types of grazing that that um, is is being used. Um, and then we got we got a five-year grant from the AGGP program, this Agricultural Greenhouse Gases Program with um, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada, um, uh, to to do this contrast between the multi paddock um, grazing and, and uh, conventional uh, gra grazing systems. And not only did we look at uh, the soils and um, vegetation, but we also um, um, had a look at the socioeconomic aspects of, 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 the, uh, of the system. So our study design with uh, 30 uh, pairs of ranches, a total of 60 ranches, there, there are other ranches that were included in parts of our study, but the, the comparison of AMP versus non-AMP involved 30 pairs of ranches. And these are shown on this map 
um, that, that shows you the um, ecoregions of the Canadian Great Plains. And, um, and you can see that, that much, uh, the majority of them actually, the, the largest number occur in the Aspen Park uh, zone. Um, there are a few up in the boreal transition zone and a few down in the, in the, in the south in the um, uh, mixed grass prairie. But uh, the largest number of our uh, units occur in the uh, Aspen Parkland. Uh, so this just shows the soils um, across that um, that region, and, and the soils, of course, vary with the vegetation type. Um, and this shows the precipitation gradient. Uh, there are um, moist uh, moister areas of the Great Plains in the northwest and in the far east. But in general, there's a, a west to east precipitation gradient uh, that it, it, uh, that we have greater moisture in uh, Manitoba than we do across uh, southeastern Alberta and, and, and Saskatchewan. And this shows the temperature gradient um, with the uh, cooler temperatures, of course, in the north. And, and of course, Winnipeg being the coldest place on the planet. Um, so um, one of the first things, of course, then is to look at the vegetation and how it responded to um, grazing treatments. And so we looked at uh, plant species composition, um, above ground biomass, root biomass, the length of the roots, um, the plant litter biomass, and the, the uh, species um, uh, diversity of plants, both um, in terms of what's called alpha diversity, meaning the diversity within these plots, 50 by 50 centimeter plots, but then also diversity among plots and across branches. So we, we had a look at diversity in different at different scales. But um, uh, one of the one of the things to point out with this uh, illustration in the lower right hand uh, corner here is how deep many of the native prairie um, plants are in and sink, they sink um, the roots very deep into the soil um, in contrast to um, tame forages. And um, if, if, if there's a, a, a bit of a frustration in, our, in our, our sampling is that we had so few branches in Canada truly have native prairie, so many have at one point or in time or another um, have uh, uh, either plowed or dissed um, the area and put in uh, tame um, uh, forage, meaning such things as, as brome grass and Kentucky bluegrass and, and um, uh, tame, tame rye and fescue. And uh, Tim, now Timothy is a good one because Timothy is really deep rooted, but many of these other um, uh, na uh, tame forages are really shallow rooted. They don't sink as much uh, carbon into the soil and not as deep into the soil as do the, the, the native prairie uh, plants. And there are many advantages um, to having that deep rooted, um, those deep rooted plants because they are m more resilient to, to variation in precipitation, to drought conditions, and, and they also um, uh, hold the carbon better uh, than than tame forages do. Um, and so, if you look at the at the um, different types of, of plants that we found on EMP versus non-EMP um, uh, rangelands, the the bar graph on the right shows that you know we've got uh, alfalfa and clover. Uh, SB stands for smooth brome. Um, Timothy, uh, crested wheatgrass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, um, and and you can see that that, that that there's not that there's not any consistent huge difference in the composition of the AMP uh, ranches versus the non-AMP, um, but the diversity was higher in the um, uh, in AMP uh, uh, ranches than in the the non-AMP um, ranches. Found 
two hundred species, a total of two hundred uh, species of, of plants. Then we we sampled soils and we used this this um, uh, sampler um, that it is an approved uh, sampling device. Uh, it, it's been approved by the uh, um, Verified Carbon Standard. Um, for soil quantification. And it, it uh, takes a tube of soil that's one meter deep. So we we collected thousands of soil cores across our study area um, with uh, at least 15 soil cores per ranch. There was actually additional soil um, sampling for various parts of the, the project, like the root, root study but uh, kind of the base soil sampling were these 15 soil cores that were, were uh, taken uh, on, on each ranch. And in those soil cores, we measured soil organic uh, matter. We uh, measured uh, soil organic carbon and uh, nitrogen, inorganic carbon, uh, bulk density, texture, pH of the soil, salinity. Um, a number of metrics of, of uh, soil soils that were then taken from these cores. Now, these are some of the um, the results of the soil organic carbon, um, and uh, <clears throat> you can see on the left hand side uh, bar graph that there really is no difference between AMP uh, ranches and the non AMP ranches in soil organic carbon. Um, had I given this presentation a couple of weeks ago, I would have said that the AMP uh, ranches had higher soil organic carbon, but we hadn't finished the analysis of all of the ranches by that time, and and um, we just got those done, um, got those all done a few days ago, and lo and behold, the soil organic carbon um, and bulk density do not really differ. Um, either in the in the shallow zero to 15 centimeters um, part of the soil or in the 15 to 30 uh, centimeters part of the, of the soil. So they're not all that different in the um, soil organic carbon. But it's much more complicated than just the soil organic carbon and it depends on the on the microorganisms that and uh, enzymes in soils and this is getting out of my area of training, and I'm so lucky to have colleagues at the University of Alberta who understand how to do this stuff with um, RNA and DNA sampling methods and being able to um, uh, measure uh, fungi and bacteria in the in soil, different types of bacteria. There are methanotrophic and methanogenic uh, uh, bacteria that do different things to to the soil, and so um, at the at the very bottom, there's there's a bit of a, a chart there showing the soil carbon storage um, being maximized. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, being maximized uh, when, when you have light grazing. Uh, light grazing gives you the greatest amount of soil being stored in. Uh, excuse me, the greatest amount of carbon being stored in the soil. And there you have a mixture of fungi and bacteria. Um, the fungi do quite different things in the soil uh, by being able, with their hyphae, being able to go into, into uh, rocks and really fine spaces and being able to extract things that, that, that then they share with the plants. So mycorrhizal fungi that, that are in symbiotic relationships with, with the plants. And if the grazing pressure is too heavy, the fungi are diminished and it becomes a more bacteria dominated uh, uh, soil um, and you don't get as, as much carbon uh, sequestered into the soil uh, when you lose that fungal connection that is so essential in extracting uh, some of the, the, the goodies out of the, out of the, the uh, uh, organic matter. So the uh, uh, fungal community uh, differs depending upon the grazing systems. So AMP on the, the left two bars here and non-AMP on the, the right two bars. So the amount of, of fungi is 
is significantly higher in um, uh, non-seeded um, uh, native prairie, uh, but seeded areas um, have uh, lower fungi in AMP uh, grazing on AMP grazing systems. Uh, the fung fungi to uh, bacteria ratio also differs in AMP grazing systems with with the um, uh, tame pastures, the seeded pastures, the the orange bars uh, being significantly lower in AM, uh, on AMP ranches um, than, than in in the um, seeded uh, excuse me the seeded ones being significantly lower uh, fungi to bacterial ratio than in the non-seeded native native pastures there are also enzymes in the soil that are very important from the standpoint of in the case of the beta glucose base being able to break down the cellulose and um, in, in the, the, the uh, plant cell walls and giving access to the, the goodies that are on the inside of the cell wall and being able to uh, better extract the nutrients out of the, the uh, plants, the, the vegetation that's, that's incorporated into, into the soil, that difference doesn't, is overwhelmed by photosynthesis during the growing season. But at the end of the growing season in September, we see significant differences in, in uh, uh, glucosidase, making nutrients more available um, in the AMP versus the non-AMP soils. And um, uh, likewise, uh, phosphatase, uh, making phosphorus more available in at the end of the growing season is when we see the differences in, emerge in these enzymes in the soil. We also had a look at greenhouse gas exchange. And so we have carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide uh, going into the atmosphere. Um, and so um, uh, Barat, our postdoc, uh, did this uh, sampling uh, with uh, chambers and, and uh, use gas chromatograph for analyzing the um, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, and, and the fluxes that are occurring. And so we lose um, methane into the atmosphere from enteric fermentation, meaning cow burps and farts. And, and we lose uh, nitrous oxide and uh, methane <clears throat> from manure. Um, uh, from soils that are turned over, we uh, uh, soils in general, we're, we're, we lose um, nitrous oxide, but we we um, through photosynthesis, uh, carbon dioxide is sunk into the soils uh, by the plants, and so we were able to to, to measure these things and. And there were significant differences between the AMP and the non-AMP uh, uh, ranches. And so um, the differences are, are in, in the case of, of uh, carbon dioxide flux and nitrous oxide flux, uh, we have uh, more um, loss of carbon dioxide in non-AMP uh, soils at higher temperatures. And likewise, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, greater flux, greater loss of um, nitrous oxide at high, higher temperatures in the non-AMP um, uh, ranches. The, the um, CH4 flux, meaning methane, come, being brought into the soil is um, significantly greater uh, on the AMP ranches. So more of the methane is being, being um, harnessed into the soil uh, by microorganisms, um, especially at higher temperatures, but even at, at lower, lower temperatures, we're seeing more methane um, fixed into, into the soil. 
we also measured water infiltration. And one of Savory's points that he makes quite dramatically in some of his presentations is how important um, AMP grazing is for maintaining soil structure that allows for um, moisture to be sunk into the soil. It, it, you, you're better able to retain soil moisture because of that, and you have less runoff and loss of water. And, and so we use this dual head infiltrometer to measure um, water infiltration in, in soils on AMP versus non-AMP soils. And there was a, uh, a significant uh, increase in water, uh, soil water infiltration on AMP uh, ranch soils. Albedo is something that we needed to measure to be able to evaluate remote sensing data, meaning MODIS satellite-based uh, um, surface reflectance. So you can you can get uh, uh, you can calculate uh, measures of productivity um, and green herbaceous phytomass by using um, linear combinations of spectral band data that come from satellite. Um, imagery, uh, but we needed to have a handle on albedo, um, and we had a hypothesis as to which way it would, would likely go, but it turns out that there really weren't any differences in albedo between the AMP and non-AMP soil, so it's sort of a non-issue, but we had to measure it to be able to uh, to know that, and we use, we use drones to be able to to get this L these albedo uh, measurements. Now, uh, <clears throat> Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada didn't see any utility in um, getting a handle on avian biodiversity, so they explicitly exclude the, remove that portion of our of our projects. So we got funding from the Society for Conservation Biology to do this work. Um, but uh, grassland birds are the most imperiled group of birds on the planet. Um, we are losing grassland birds at, at, a, at, a, at a very high rate everywhere around the world uh, because of agricultural intensification, because of conversion of grasslands into, into cropland, and uh, many, many species of grassland birds are in, in, uh, in deep trouble. Um, three and uh, three out of four or eastern meadowlarks have have been lost since 1970, um, and and so we use birds as a as another biodiversity indicator in addition to the, the plant work that we did, um, and again this is a very important conservation motivation for our project, um, and so we had point count sampling uh, where we we uh, sampled. Um, songs and, and observe observations of, of birds um, early in the morning on, um, on, on uh, this sample of AMP and non-AMP uh, ranches. We recorded over 100 uh, species of, of birds. And this is a list of, of uh, a number of the birds. The ones that are circled in red here on the right are the ones that actually were enhanced on in, with AMP grazing. And those include bobolink and grasshopper sparrow, uh, lacan sparrow, uh, savannah sparrow, vesper sparrow, and western meadowlark. Those species do better on AMP grazing. Um, and but but if you think about the way in which livestock are moved around on an AMP ranch, they'll spend you know um, two, three, four days on a on a particular paddock, and then they're moved on to the next paddock, and then on to the next paddock. But during the month of June, which is the crucial one as it relates to, to birds being able to get their brood off, during the month of June, maybe half of, of an AMP ranch will have been grazed, and half of it won't have had any grazing whatsoever during that key period uh, for, for bird nesting. So roughly half the, half the ranch is, is uh, fully uh, available for uh, grassland bird um, nesting. There are some species that do best in on a very short sward, meaning 
a heavily grazed or really a short grass prairie sort of situation. Excuse me. And, and those include um, the upland sandpiper, willet. Willet need wetlands, but they nest in the uplands in short grass prairie situations. Uh, chestnut collared longspur and sprague's pippet. All of those are short grass prairie species, and they do better on a, a non AMP situation where you have greater variability in in the intensity of, of livestock uh, uh, use across the landscape and um, creates a situation that, that, that's actually better for the birds. At the end of the day, probably the best strategy um, in, from the standpoint of bird diversity is to have a mix of ranching uh, practices um, occurring across the landscape. If everybody did it the same way, there'd be different groups of birds that would do very poorly, um, even more poorly. But uh, having a mixture of, of ranching practices across the landscape maintains diversity. Now, how the ranchers are actually doing things is summarized here. And Edward Wark put this slide together for me. Um, and and it, it summarizes the, the details. And the, the, this it may be difficult to see the numbers here, but I can see it well on my screen. Um, so, so for example, um, the grazing period, the third line from the bottom, how long cattle are in a paddock so it would be 2.8 days um, during the early season, so before the end of July. Uh, whereas in the non-AMP, it's 76 days. And there, there are several aspects of AMP versus non-AMP that, that are quite strikingly different there are a number of other attributes that are almost identical. Time since last cultivation, uh, uh, some of the ranches have, have never been cultivated, but um, if they had been cultivated, it's roughly about 20 years um, uh, since they had been cultivated, and that's almost exactly the same. On average, I should say, but, um, between A and P and non A and P. We were selective um, in choosing AMP ranches that had been under AMP for at least 10 years, ideally. And, and uh, so there were very few of our AMP ranches that haven't been at it for, for, um, for at, least, at least 10 years. Um, so at any rate, this summarizes the sizes of the uh, ranches. The AMP ranches tend to be larger in size, uh, non-AMP, um, uh, ranchers oftentimes have other things going on on their ranch as part of the reason that the total area grazed is less because they've got some rope they've, they've got some uh, cropland as well as grazing land whereas people that are who are practicing AMP spend a lot of time with their livestock and and so may have less um, uh, cropland uh, down in this uh, bar chart on the lower left uh, shows the ratio of rest grazing days uh, and you can see that there's a much longer period of rest for AMP ranches. They tend to be rested for more than 40 days. Um, in fact, uh, not uncommon to have 60 to 90 day rest period before they're grazed again. So we have hired uh, Bill Salas, who's a, uh, uh, an ecological modeler out of New Hampshire, who is is um, using this DNDC um, uh, model to pull it all together for us. And so this will allow us to have a map of um, across the entire Great Plains of Canada in terms of the carbon um, uh, pool and uh, distribution um, on various uh, properties. Now, I want to talk for a little bit about about uh, carbon markets. And there are some well, somewhat exciting opportunities that are developing. But the idea is that um, emitters of carbon into the atmosphere, industrial emitters, like a, 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 an oil refinery, for example, um, will, will spew this stuff into the atmosphere. And then they get, they get taxed for doing that. And um, we started in, in uh, 2007, I think it was, in Alberta, taxing um, 
emitters who produce more than 100,000 tons of CO2 equivalents into the atmosphere, and they get taxed $25 per ton, and that's going up gradually over, over time, but they have to pay into this fund. It used to be, when it was originally established, it was called CCEMC, which stood for Climate Change Emissions Management Corporation. Um, it's, it's now called PIER, but at any rate, those funds then are used to somehow uh, offset those emissions some way. Some are using mechanical methods to extract CO2 from smokestacks and to then pump it down into the ground to get more oil out of oil wells. Um, there are other operations like this huge one in Saskatchewan where um, the, the um, CO2 is, is just sunk into deep caverns under underground and capped to hopefully keep it down there. Um, but, but some of those funds can be used for supporting various um, biological programs like agriculture that, that can actually uh, absorb carbon and, and put it in the soil or, or wherever. So that's the idea behind um, these uh, uh, carbon offset markets. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Canada is a little slow in getting, getting behind um, the program for grasslands management. At the moment, at, at the moment, there are no Canadian programs for carbon offsets for grazing, but the um, uh, but, but CAR, which is based in California, um, has a program that has been approved. And so this Alberta Technology and Innovation, Technology, Innovation and Emissions Reduction Program, TIER, is mostly focused on technological um, ways to get CO2 off of smokestacks, that kind of thing, as opposed to taking advantage of the photosynthesis to get the, the carbon sunk into the, into the soil or into trees, that, that kind of thing. But um, there are programs, uh, active programs now in Montana, in Oregon, in Colorado, where ranchers are getting paid for managing grassland in a way that um, uh, uh, prevents uh, loss, that is avoided conversion, preventing it from going into, uh, into cropland, or to actually pay them for the carbon that's being sequestered and stored in, in the soil. Um, they, the, uh, uh, th there are a few of these programs, but the one that I think is, is probably most relevant to all of, all of you is the new one, the Canadian Grasslands Protocol that is, uh, has been registered with the Climate Action Reserve. And this just happened like, what, a month ago or two months ago, it's very recent. And um, it's been approved by the Climate Action Reserve. There's some paperwork and there's an 18 month development period, but payment for grassland avoided conversion to maintain the carbon in the soil is pretty lucrative. I mean, well, evaluate for yourself, but um, the, 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 it depends on the source of the revenue, but typically $25 an acre sort of payment um, for entering into a contract that will tie it up for 100 years. You're committing that it won't be plowed for 100 years and that we'll be able to retain that carbon in the soil and we won't lose it due to tillage. In addition, you are restricted on how many cattle you can have. Overgrazing is not allowed. A and P would be okay. Um, at light grazing level would be would be okay. Uh, but but excessive grazing uh, is not allowed, and you have to report every year how many cattle you've got. Um, but there's a there's a beautiful webinar on this that goes into into the details. 
what's required in terms of reporting and and uh, the use of of uh, uh, <coughs> conservation easements uh, to essentially enter into a contract that you won't um, you won't violate you won't plow it. Um, and if you look at this uh, blue source, that's all you need to remember is blue source. Go look it up. Go look it up on on the web. Um, they have a webinar, and the second one on their list is called Grassland Carbon Offset Development, and it go it walks you through the exact details of, of, of what's required. The person in charge of the Canadian program is is Jamie McKinnon. Uh, they have several staff people um, at Blue Source, but, but Jamie McKinnon lives in Ontario and is in charge of the of the uh, Canadian Grasslands uh, Protocol. Now, I, this is all new. And it's very uh, recently finalized the, the uh, agreement with the Climate Action Reserve, um, and nobody's done it yet. It, like I said, there's there's um, uh, there are actually a couple ranches in Montana now where they're getting uh, carbon payments, uh, six in in uh, Colorado and three in Oregon. But this is a this is a new uh, a newly uh, developing thing to be able to, to get. Um, uh, carbon credits you get paid for carbon credits and 25 to 50 dollars an acre is not to be scoffed at um, uh, as additional revenue to make it more convincing that you should raise cows instead of canola so just to to summarize i've used up my time um, recommendations uh, that are clearly coming from our our work is if you've got native prairie, it's very important, very valuable, and uh, it has so many uh, values in terms of, of avoiding uh, fluctuations uh, attributable to drought, uh, maintaining diversity, and sinking carbon deep in the soil where it's it's there for good. Um, native prairie is is uh, is the best, and if you've got it, keep it. And you're going to get you're going to get paid more uh, for this uh, these, these programs like the Climate Action Reserve if you've got native prairie. Um, if you don't have native prairie, restoring permanent grassland cover is a step in the right direction. If you're going to get paid through this Climate Action Reserve program, though, you have to have had permanent grassland cover for 30 years, or you're not going to get you're not going to be able to be eligible for their program. So if you um, if you if you've got some pain pasture, so long as it stays at, without being plowed for 30 years, it will be eligible for um, carbon payments. Um, if you have heavy stocking rates, that's one of the worst things you can do to, to a, 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 a rangeland is to over overgraze it, and uh, uh, there. There are some model systems in Alberta, for example, uh, uh, the McIntyre Ranch uh, south of, of Lethbridge, you know, where they've maintained low to moderate levels of, of stocking and they weathered that drought in 2002 uh, where everybody else was having serious problems. You know, variation in, in, in uh, uh, weather from year to year is buffered by having uh, moderate um, Raising intensity and maintaining good, good grassland cover. AMP grazing is effective, um, and I emphasize adaptive. One of the one of the sticky wickets with AMP grazing is that you need to shift the number of, of animals that you've got. And if it's if you're having a drought, you need to reduce the number of animals, perhaps. And and so having too many having a heavy stocking rate, even though you might do really well during good precipitation periods, um, it's going to be a real problem then during drought periods and how you get rid of those livestock and then not being able to bring them back the next year. Um, keeping a, a, a lighter uh, stocking level will uh, pay off uh, e even under AMP grazing. And um, we need to um, get people 
making application for carbon credits and, and carbon tax revenues. Like I said, we don't have a Canadian program. We have the one out of California the, uh, that is approved for Canadian grasslands, but there's no Canadian program. And we, we need one, I think, you know, especially with the federal carbon tax, those revenues should be available and there ought to be a protocol developed for um, accessing revenues at both the provincial and, and federal level. So um, you all, I mean, I, I presume that most of the audience are private landowners um, and, and the conservation value of private lands uh, can't be overstated. It's an extremely important part of, of conservation in, in today's, uh, today's world. And I want to emphasize my, my gratitude to some of my colleagues who have been just terrific to work with. Edward Bork and Cam Carlisle and Scott Chang, those three guys over in, in, uh, uh, in, in range, uh, over in, in uh, the renewable resources uh, and uh, ALs, it's called, on, on campus. Uh, agricultural life and environmental sciences faculty. Uh, those guys have been a terrific help and they fill in all these things that I know very little about, such as enzymes and using DNA methods to sample microorganisms in the soil. J.C. Cahill, um, a plant ecologist. Uh, uh, Scott Jeffrey is an economist. We haven't got the economics work done yet. Uh, the environmental sociology work isn't done yet. It's underway. Um, Steve Applebaum helped early on in the project and provided the soil sampler. Um, Bill Salas is doing the big scale modeling. Uh, Richard Teague helped us with identifying AMP ranches and helped in coordination and organization of the project up front. And, uh, and then we've got a, a cast of thousands of graduate students and, and postdocs and technicians and, um, and volunteers. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was a really informative presentation. Uh, really interesting and clear. I really got a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, feel free to type it into the webinar section. Um, and Dr. Boyce, there are a couple questions here. Um, a listener named Jian Ju, pardon my pronunciation, is wondering what is the typical size or dimensions of paddocks? And this may be helpful for assessing the use of high resolution satellite data. Okay, this, this chart right here shows the uh, mean pasture size for AMP um, uh, grazing, it's about 50 acres. And for non-AMP, the pastures are bigger, 120 hectares. So what is that? 300 acres, uh, almost a half section. So a quarter, quarter section versus a half section. So non-AMP ranches are, are um, have much larger paddocks, much larger pastures. Um, Whereas uh, AMP ranchers tend to, the average, about 50 acres. Thank you for that answer. Um, from the same listener, uh, this person's also wondering, what are the key management parameters or specifications for AMP, um, like the portion of area under grazing and the grazing periods? Well, again, that's summarized here. Every, one of the one of the difficult things and one of the reasons that Alan Savory has said uh, you can't use science to evaluate um, AMP grazing because everybody does it differently and indeed everybody does it differently. You can't find two ranchers in Canada who do everything exactly the same, period. It just doesn't happen and it shouldn't happen because everybody has different soils, you have different vegetation, you got different livestock, different breeds of livestock, different numbers of livestock and 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 you have sort of a different mentality a different way of doing things i mean when i i grew up on a farm and i did everything the way my granddad taught me how to do it you know and 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 getting people to change can be uh quite a challenge um so um at any rate this this uh this chart that i've i've got on the screen um summarizes all of the details of how AMP grazing is done across Canada's um, grasslands. So um, 
81% of the AMP uh, ranchers had some um, cultivation history in the past, meaning that they had put cane pasture on 81% of the AMP uh, uh, lands. Not all of, you know, people, there are people who have maybe a half of their ranch might be in native uh, native pasture and, and, and the other half uh, cane pasture. Um, but at any rate, this, this uh, chart summarizes all of the details that um, uh, is being asked. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have a couple questions, or one question from a couple listeners, sorry, um, Noreen and Derek, that are wondering about um, the eco-regions. Um, do you think that um, this, like, for example, the sites in the Aspen Parkland have deeper soils and more moisture, they're mostly tame forages. So do you, can you comment that AMP is um, better or more doable on uh, drier grassland natural regions? Um, and is it possible to kind of separate the data between these eco regions? Well, um, I would say that AMP grazing works extremely well in Aspen Parkland. Part of the reason is that we have good precipitation throughout the Aspen Parkland, deep soils, rich soils, and um, uh, in general, you can maintain a higher level of production um, on, on those uh, grasslands than you can in the mixed prairie areas in the south. Some of the so like southeastern um, Alberta is much drier than in the Aspen Parkland, um, and the same is true right on across uh, uh, Grasslands National Park, uh, southern Saskatchewan. Those areas are much drier and don't have the, um, the primary production that you get, uh, and, and, and the soils are not as deep and nor are they as productive um, as in the Aspen Parkland. Um, the Aspen Parkland kind of merges into this dark green area that's the boreal transition. And some of those areas were forested and, and trees have been removed. Um, uh, and so there are places where agriculture is pushing, the, pushing that boreal limit. And with climate change, it's going to be easier and easier to push that limit far, farther north. But, uh, but like I said, I think that the... Uh, uh, the soils are richer and the, util the utility of AMP grazing appears to be um, maybe, the, maybe the best, I suppose. Um, in, in, uh, I, I would probably be contradicted by a number of people, but it certainly works well, let's put it that way. Now, um, from an ecological standpoint, um, the Aspen Parkland of Canada is the most abused, utilized, altered. Um, it's probably the most endangered native ecosystem in Canada. Um, we use that stuff and there has been agriculture on almost all of it sometime or another um, because it's got, because we have rich soils. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I, did I answer the question? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, do you think in the future you would be able to separate your data based on the different eco regions? So we have that. Okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't present it that way. Okay. Okay. But Thank you. For that we, we, we have that. Yes. Okay. Um, a listener named Laura would like to know if you think the one meter uh, soil core is deep enough to measure carbon storage under native vegetation. Oh yes, most. Um, most of the carbon is in the top 30 centimeters. Um, as you go deeper than that, um, the amount of carbon uh, drops off quite quite rapidly. It, again, it depends on the soil type. Um, in in the Aspen Parkland, uh, the black soil profile goes down on average to 90 um, uh, centimeters, um, and and then below, below that you have the, the subsoil. Um, that does not have nearly as much carbon in it. If you look through the literature, it's pretty uncommon that people measure a full meter like we did. So we've got some, uh, we've got some pretty, uh, pretty deep soil cores 
Uh, there certainly is carbon below that, but much less. And I think within a meter, we pretty well capture most of it. Thank you. That's a great answer. A listener named Noreen also has a soil question, and she's wondering about the lack of differences in soil metrics, such as the soil carbon and soil bulk density. Um, is there any change over time when it's under um, AMP? For example, longer time in AMP, there'll be more carbon um, or improved soil, soil structure, or it doesn't change with time? Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, we um, included only ranches that had 10 years worth of, of AMP grazing history to, to make it, to make the cut. Um, maybe, uh, and I, I can't answer that question uh, because we don't know. Um, could, if, if, if we were to sample only ranches that had been after it for 30 years at least, um, would we see a difference? I, um, I don't know. You know, the, the, uh, like I said, everybody manages a little bit differently. And it's not as though the people who are doing not, the non-AMP ranchers don't know what they're doing. They've been after those guys, have been, those ranchers have been after it for a long time. And many of them are outstanding ranchers. They just don't practice AMP, the AMP business, the intensive AMP moving the cattle quite so often. Um, it results in a different vegetation structure on the landscape um, uh, to have AMP versus not non-AMP, but it, that's not to imply that non-AMP um, uh, ranchers aren't doing a really good job of it. So um, those soils on non-AMP on non-AMP ranches where they've been managed well, those soils are really good. And that's what our data show, is that on average, ranches across the Great Plains of, of Canada are pretty darn good. Thank you. Um, a listener named Trevor says, uh, Dr. Boyce, what can be said about the relative value of finishing cattle on grass versus in feedlots? I have no, um, no respect for feedlots operations whatsoever. Sorry, I'm an ecologist. I just can't go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in terms of in terms of carbon emissions, it's a bad practice. It gives beef industry a really bad name for in the climate change arena. Um, it is not something that I will support or say anything good about. Okay. Grass fed beef is just fine. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, we have a couple listeners who are um, looking for more information about water infiltration. Um, and one listener named Catherine is wondering why does it increase with AMP and is wondering if the short term soil compaction would impede um, the infiltration. And another listener is wondering if, um, if it means that there's better drought resistance over the long term uh, and better durability of carbon storage throughout droughts. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> on my insulting response to the last question, I just ought to throw in that I grew up on a farm where we raised beef cattle, and it was a feedlot kind of <laughs> operation. So I grew up doing that, but I sure don't think it's a good idea as an ecologist. But back to the question. Uh, let me let me go to the infiltrometer slide. Um, the uh, yeah, here, here's the gadget. I lost. There it is. Um, so it, it's a it's kind of a gadget that you you uh, uh, fix down onto the ground and then you pour water into it and then it, it and then you see how long it takes for that water and how you know to to then be uh, uh, absorbed into the into the soil. So a dual head infiltrometer, it's called. The re the reason that uh, um, uh, Richard Teague and Alan Savory will tell you that AMP does so much better is that cattle are on those um, areas for a short period of time. Their hooves trample the soil, kind of stir it up a little bit. They're, you know, you've got lots of cattle on a small area for a short period of time. They really hit it hard, but then they're out of there. There is no more compaction by hooves 
there's no more use of that area for at least, well, I, I, I've forgotten the numbers, I just read them to you, but it's like at, at least 50 days or so before they come back. And, and so you have a long period of rest there where the vegetation is, is rebuilding, there's a litter that, 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 that develops on the, on the surface of the soil, and the, the quality of the, of the, of the uh, structure of, of the soil is improved so that it absorbs more moisture. And yes, exactly, that's important because that means that there's more moisture in the soil to be able to buffer a drought, let's say, um, and and uh, um, and, and there, there's good field evidence from other studies, not not ours, but from other studies showing that that if you've got uh, good soil moisture and you've got a diverse plant community, like in a native prairie, you're going to lose less moisture, you're going to lose less carbon, and you're going to retain that that moisture um, uh, for a longer period of time. That's really interesting. Um, uh, another listener is wondering about um, separating this result, these results here for um, soil type and if texture would not have a greater influence over the infiltration rate than, uh, than the grazing system. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Could you um, read that again? Yeah, so it, um, this listener is wondering um, why you didn't separate the soil types for infiltration oh, and suggest oh, that texture. That was, I just didn't present. I didn't present. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, we we have those data and um, and I um, and I can't remember enough about the details of, of the differences of, by by soil type, but absolutely, there's a big difference. You know, uh, different types of soils. Um, uh, I mean, a sandy soil, then our water will just go right through. But uh, there are other uh, types of soil with lots of clay that the water does not infiltrate well. And uh, uh, if you get compaction in a, in a heavy clay soil, uh, it, the water will just run off. So, but but we do have those data. Um, I just didn't summarize them in this presentation, and I and I don't remember enough of the re results to say anything intelligent about it. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Um, there's a listener that's wondering if you could clarify um, the number of head of cattle that would be ideal for um, AMP. Um, she believes she heard 66, but just wants to clarify that. Um, okay, this this chart again gives us the um, animal units, AUMs, uh, the stocking rate, uh, so stocking rate per hectare. Um, the um, ideal number of livestock, um, that's a tough one and it depends on, it depends on the ranch and how productive it is and what the soils are like um, and uh, and what type of gra grazing is practiced under AMP, the stocking rates tend to be higher than they are on non-AMP. Um, AMP ranchers are paying much closer attention to their livestock and what they're doing and moving them on when the time is right and, and paying much closer attention to uh, to where the animals are distributed. Whereas with non-AMP ranches, oftentimes there'll be a, well, you can see right here on this on this chart that the mean pasture size for non-AMP is 120 hectares. So whatever that is, almost a half section. Um, and, and, and what that means is that cattle have pretty much free access to that entire parcel and, and you see a lot more variation in the in the use of the vegetation. Um, with a non-AMP grazing operation, the cattle will they, they they'll leave more patches of stuff that they don't like, and and they'll graze some of the more preferred forages more heavily uh, because they pretty much have free reign to go wherever they want, and if, and and they use the area much less evenly. It results in greater patchiness of the vegetation um, uh, than in an AMP ranching operation where th there's more removal of all of the vegetation 
uh, when they're in there at high densities for a short period of time. Whereas in the uh, non-AMP, the, the selection by the cattle results in more variation. You have increasers and decreasers and, and uh, variation in, in, the, in the types of plants that, that uh, you'll see across, across the ranch um, uh, being more variable on non-AMP than AMP. I've forgotten the question. I think you answered it. <laughs> um, there's a couple more questions about um, grazing management. Um, one is from a listener named Majid that's wondering about um, comparing AMP with highly grazed in non-AMP pastures, um, if that would be better than um, a better way of understanding the benefit of AMP grazing. Well, um, no, I think not, and and I and I say that because um, if if you have higher uh, grazing pressure on non-AMP, you end up with some areas that get overgrazed, and that's the worst thing you can do to a range is is to have excessive uh, grazing pressure, it results in in loss of carbon. You have more erosion. Um, you don't want to go there if you can help it. So, um, in, increasing um, uh, the, the stocking rates on non-AMP, so they're at as high a level as you can maintain with AMP, I wouldn't recommend it, and I don't think that, um, that most range managers would either. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think that's all the questions that um, that we have time for today. So um, with that, I really want to thank you for, for your really informative presentation, um, for sharing all of your experience and amazing research that you've been doing with us today. So thank you very much. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in to our first webinar of Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Uh, we will have webinars going on every day and check out the PCAP website for information about those. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so if you missed anything, you can check it out on the YouTube channel in the near future. And when you leave this webinar, uh, there'll be a quick one minute survey that'll pop up. If you don't mind filling it out, it'll help us keep our Prairie's Got the Goods Week going in the future. So with that, thank you so so much everyone and uh, thanks again for the great presentation and everyone have a great rest of your day and happy Monday. Thanks Caitlin. Thank you. Bye. Bye.